So the first, the first of my top 10 things for, uh, that I think characterize a central, uh, uh, that, that characterize a successful entrepreneur is something that is referred in, in uh, entrepreneurial academic circles as the divine ratio. And the divine ratio has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with physiology. The divine ratio is simply this. You have two eyes, two ears, and one mouth. So you should look and listen four times as much as you speak. And that's a very good lesson for life and certainly a very good lesson for developing a business. It's really, really easy to get caught up in everything that you're doing and not look, not listen. And one of the things that we've heard from other speakers is that one of the best ways to figure out what the next good thing, what the next big thing is going to be, is by looking around, talking to people and listening to people, mainly listening and watching. So if there's one thing you take away from my talk is those two words, the divine ratio. And if you employ them in your business world and even your personal world, you'll find that life gets to be a little more interesting. I've always found that as an entrepreneur, it really, really pays to be a student of people. And what do I mean by a student of people? You need to be perceptive. You need to read people. You need to read the people you're trying to lead. You need to read the people you're trying to sell to. And you need to read the people you're trying to get to invest in your enterprise. And that's not a skill that comes naturally or easily to everyone, but it's something you can learn with practice. And every successful entrepreneur that I know develops um, very quickly a connection with whoever his or her audience is. And so when you think about yourself as an entrepreneur, the reason I'm going through these things is to be a little bit introspective and to ask you to be introspective and ask yourself, do I do these things? Do these characterize me? Um, because if they do, you'll have a leg up in becoming a successful entrepreneur. This is another, for those of us that, that teach entrepreneurship and um, encourage the notion that um, any enterprise is, is better when there's a, a team formed around perhaps the initial um, protagonist or the initial entrepreneur. There's no I in the word team, okay? And so the good entrepreneur understands that he or she can't do it alone. And the good entrepreneur understands that they shouldn't be up in front of a, a group of people taking credit. The best entrepreneurs are cheerleaders for their teams. Now, this might sound almost oxymoronic. The successful entrepreneur is prepared, prepared for and generally, and generally has known failure. Now, you've heard that a little bit from, from other speakers at the conference, and it's very, very true. The most successful entrepreneurs have failed in their lives. There are good ways to fail, and there are bad ways to fail. The second, the second clause there is an eternal optimist. So how can you be prepared for failure? In fact, in many cases, consider that the odds are pretty decent that you may fail and yet be an optimist. Because the entrepreneur, the successful entrepreneur, sees the knowledge that's gained from every failure and learns from those mistakes. So it's okay to fail. Just don't make the same mistake twice. This fifth point has a keen grasp of the targeted end game. So, Every business enterprise is different. Every business enterprise's goal is different, all right? But you should understand at the beginning what you're setting out to do. How do you define success? Is it achieving a certain market share? Is it making a certain kind of difference in the lives of, of the customers that you have? How are you defining success? 
okay? There are financial metrics that also need to be infused into that definition of success, but the financial metrics should not be the be-all and end-all, are typically not the be-all and end-all for an entrepreneur. Financial metrics as kind of the be-all and end-all, or at least what the outside world views as the be-all and end-all, they come later. They come when you're a publicly listed company and you're forced to manage quarter by quarter. I've done that and it's no fun. It's not nearly as much.